Good morning and welcome to our service of worship. It's hard to believe that it's been just over four months since we last met together in the building in Bridge Street. But we are so thankful to live in a world of modern technology that means we can still gather together either through Facebook or YouTube or for those without internet access listening in on our service telephone line. And we're thankful that God is not confined to a building and that the church is not just bricks and mortar but us, God's people, under his kingship. And life is slowly starting to dip its toe back into the realms of what we call normality. So this means that this week we are launching our fellowship groups, which will meet in the church fortnightly. If you haven't yet received a letter telling you the dates and times of your group, please contact your care coordinator from church council or myself directly. I understand that for some of you, it's either unwise for you to join us in the building just yet, or you may feel a little fearful. Please don't feel under any obligation to come, but know that when you are ready, you will be made very welcome. I want to thank Bill Campbell, our property steward, and now also our COVID-19 health and safety coordinator for heading up all the work to get the building ready for us. We couldn't be at this stage without him. At the end of the service this morning, there will be a video which will walk you through the building and I would ask that you would listen carefully so you're aware of what to expect when we do join together. As I've said previously, I'll be in holidays for the month of August, although I will be preaching next Sunday and will be attending some of the fellowship groups. But if you need a minister during August, please contact either your care coordinator or Chris Matheson and they will contact a minister for you. As we are all aware, COVID-19 is a global pandemic and it's with great sadness that I share with you the news this morning of the death of one of our WDR family in South Africa. We've heard often of the work of Pakamisa in Pinetown Methodist Church and this was headed up by Togazani. Sadly, Togazani, with a few others, contracted COVID-19 and passed away on Monday of this week. This morning, we remember all who knew and loved her and give thanks for the way in which she served God with a big smile and an even bigger heart. Her legacy will continue through the work of Pakamisa, and we're thankful that today she is in the presence of God. As we come to worship, let us hear some words from Psalm 47, which encourage us, sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is King over all the earth. Praise him with a psalm. God reigns above the nations, sitting on his holy throne. Let us come before that throne in prayer. Let us pray. God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we pray that as we come into your presence, that you would quiet our minds. Still our hearts, Lord, so that we can hear your voice and live as you would want us to. Strengthen our lives and inspire our spirits so that we may feel your living water flow through, through us. Through your endless grace, may we come to know and serve you better. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn this morning speaks of God seated on his throne and calls us to come and adore him. Let's sing together that beautiful hymn, Behold Our God. Just any of his 
We have just sung those beautiful words, who has felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man, God eternal, humbled to the grave, Jesus saviour, risen now to reign. And so we acknowledge that we are a sinful people, and it's only through the cross that we find salvation and forgiveness. So let us come before God and confess our sins. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have not always lived in ways that reflect your love for all. There are times when prejudice and ignorance have caused us to judge others. Judge them as less important, less capable, less whole than ourselves. Gracious God, release us and grant us mercy. Lord, we have not always lived as people assured of our place in God's heart. There are times when despair has been our refuge and we have turned away from God's promises. Gracious God, release us and grant us hope. We have not always lived as disciples of Jesus. There are times when the path to wealth and to power have been more attractive than the longer roads of justice, peace and intolerance. Or intolerance. Gracious God, release us and grant us courage. Father, we have not always lived as people of the resurrection. There are times when we have only seen the world as a place of threat and of brokenness. We have thought it's been forgotten by God. Gracious God, release us and grant us wisdom. In the quietness, we remember those thoughts, actions and words that have marred your image in us when we have hurt others and damaged the world. God has heard the confession of our hearts and our minds. In Christ we are set free. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us join together as we sing of God's wonderful grace towards us. As we sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
heard how God, a God of mercy, grace, compassion and forgiveness, saw how the people of Nineveh heeded Jonah's warning, turned from their evil ways, repented and prayed earnestly to God. And God's response is found in that last verse of Jonah chapter 3 where it says, When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Wow, what an amazing God. A God who forgives this barbaric and ruthless nation. The nation that had been responsible for destroying 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. God's own chosen people. How amazed and excited Jonah must have been. God had shown to him mercy, grace and forgiveness. And he had given him a second chance to partner alongside God in this amazing story of salvation. A story of salvation of not just a few people, but a whole city. A city, we are told at the end of chapter four, that had more than 120,000 people. Let me try and put that into context for you. That would be equivalent of the population of Cumber, Newtonards, Bangor, Dundonald, Killalay, Kalinchy, and Balagayan, all heeding the warning of God and turning to him in repentance. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that under the ministry of just one person, never mind all the churches that we have today, every conference or rally across the globe would be looking for that person as their next speaker. How do you think Jonah reacted to that great revival? Well, let's hear for the last time in this series from the Reverend David Campton as the voice of Jonah. I, d I just don't believe it. I mean, one week I'm drowning in water, another week I'm gasping for it. Any, any chance of a drink? Thanks, thanks. Cheers. That hits the spot. Anyway, uh, did you get my postcard from sunny Nineveh? Dreadful place. Give me Belfast uh, any day of the week. Uh, but you'll never guess what happened after I wrote the postcard. Uh, there I was. I had done all that God had asked me to. 
I told the Ninevites exactly what God thought of them. I didn't miss them and hit the wall, I'll tell you. I told them that they had 40 days before God was going to destroy them. And you should have seen their faces. They knew their number was up. I'd really got to them. And they started weeping and wailing and did the old sackcloth and ashes bit. It's always the same. Uh, tell people they're doomed and they start on how dreadfully sorry they are. Well, I said, it's too late. 40 days and you've had your chips. So 40 days later, I packed my bag and head out into the desert to the east of the city, sit myself down on the hill above the city to watch the fireworks. And nothing. I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew that once God saw all their tears and how, heard how dreadfully sorry they all were that, that he would change his mind. Too soft. That's what he is. Far too soft. I sat there all day in the shade of a bush, furious with God. I mean, well, could you blame me? Why bother with all that palaver over the over the big fish and everything, only to have me to go to Nineveh and make a liar out of me? Why didn't he just let me drown? I, I told him I didn't miss him and hit the wall either. I, I told him, just let me die. I said, there's no point in living anymore. And I went to sleep. But if, as if that wasn't bad enough, the next day when I woke up, the bush I'd been sitting under was dead and the wind was whipping up a sandstorm and the sun was beating down and that was it, the final straw. How dare God treat one of his servants like that and let the Ninevites off scot-free? I mean, if he treats his friends like that, it's little wonder he has so few of them. The only comfort I had was one single, solitary bush, and he just let it die. Just let me die too, I said. And all that God said in return was, what are more important, plants or people? I really don't know what he meant. David's monologue, based on chapter four of Jonah, gives us a glimpse into Jonah's human reaction, a reaction that may have surprised you. Many of us know the story of Jonah and the big fish. Perhaps a few more of us knew that God gave him a second opportunity to partner with him and that he did indeed go back to Nineveh. But did you know about Jonah's reaction? Let us hear from scripture. We're going to hear from the last verse of chapter 3 and all of chapter 4. Let us hear the word of God. Our reading today is from Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 to the end of chapter 4. When God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion, and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased, and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said, when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine, 
and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said, I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Amen. What an ending. We are used to stories finishing with a happy, positive ending. But this last chapter of Jonah shows the response of Jonah, which was far from good and leaves us with some unanswered questions. If it wasn't so serious and so sad, it would almost be comical. Because we see the prophet of God, who himself has disobeyed God and tried to run away only to be caught up in a big storm and then swallowed by a huge fish, who prayed, repented and was given a second opportunity. And we find him complaining to God, using words that God had used to describe himself to Moses back in Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34, 5 to 7, say these words. Then the Lord came down in a cloud, stood with him there, and pronounced his holy name, the Lord. The Lord then passed in front of him and called out, I, the Lord, am a God who is full of compassion and pity, who is not easily angered and who shows great love and faithfulness. I keep my promise for thousands of generations and forgive evil and sin. The words of God to Moses, quoted back to God by Jonah. And again in Psalm 86 verse 15 we read, But you, O Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Words from the Old Testament used against God. So like many a good argument, Jonah throws God's words back at him. Have you ever done that? Have you ever used the words that someone else once said to you to throw them back at them in an argument? David Campton in his video demonstrated this attitude wonderfully. In the monologue based on chapter four that we listened to earlier, we get a little glimpse of that human frustration within Jonah. And it's only now in chapter four that Jonah finally admits why he ran away in the first place. It wasn't because he was afraid of the Ninevites, these barbaric, ruthless people. Nor was it because he didn't fancy the journey of two and a half thousand miles. But as we read in verse two of this chapter, it says, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? This is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. So that's it in a nutshell. Jonah never wanted to go to Nineveh because he knew God's character and he knew that God's ideal was to reconcile the people of Nineveh to himself. He knew that God was a God who would want to demonstrate his mercy, compassion, patience and unfailing love.
towards these people that Jonah despised. He is so angry with God that he continues his rant. And he says, just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. He's talking there about the destruction that he went through the city and said 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. So in other words, if you're not prepared to destroy Nineveh, then I'd rather not live. Does this not seem hypocritical to you? Hadn't Jonah been on the receiving end of God's mercy, of God's compassion, his patience and his unfailing love? If he hadn't been, he would have drowned in the sea and never had an opportunity to serve God again. Jonah was only happy to serve God when the message was one that he liked, one that was proclaiming doom and destruction on Nineveh. And he only liked it if it was going to become true. But not only was he unhappy serving God, he wanted to die when he thought that God could forgive his enemies. How dare God? God, love me. God, forgive me. Don't get easily angered with me and be patient with my shortcomings. But God, you see those who hurt me, those who hurt the ones I love, pour out your wrath upon them, God. This was Jonah's heart. And so like a spoiled toddler, Jonah tries and throws a tantrum at God. God is like a wise parent and doesn't rise to the argument. Instead, he asks Jonah a simple question, trying to lead Jonah into conversation with himself. And God says to him, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this? Wow, what a question. What's Jonah's response? He doesn't have one. Jonah doesn't answer God. He doesn't want to engage in this type of conversation with God. He's too angry. Instead, he takes himself off on a strop to the east of the city, builds a shelter to sit under and waits to see what will happen. He's waiting to see what will happen to Nineveh. Maybe today will be the day. Maybe God will rain down fire and brimstone like he did at Sodom and Gomorrah. Perhaps today will be the day when God will send destruction on Nineveh like he did in the flood. Or how he wiped out the firstborn of all the Egyptians with the plague. Or God, are you going to kill them all like you did that Egyptian army coming through the Red Sea? This was Jonah's heart. A heart of bitterness, resentment, wanting his enemies to be judged and destroyed. None of this love, grace, mercy, compassion for them. Because in Jonah's eyes, they did not deserve it. Yet despite Jonah's attitude, and even though he walked off on God again, God still watched over him. And even more, God cared for his physical needs. So much so that we read a little of our little miracle happening as God arranged for a leafy plant to grow up and shade him from the sun. God still demonstrating love and mercy towards a rebellious, angry Jonah. Even though Jonah has lost his temper with God, shouted at God and walked away from God again, God still loves and cares for him. This is the first time we read in these four chapters that Jonah was grateful for anything. He was grateful for the shade of the plant. And it highlights to us how the salvation of Nineveh made him so angry. Yet God providing for Jonah's own needs and comfort made him happy. But this change in attitude, this happiness that comes over him, only lasts a few hours. 
because in the very next verse we read these words but God also arranged for a worm the next morning at dawn the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away that happiness didn't last too long that plant didn't cool Jonah down in his emotions God had tried the gentle approach with Jonah. He had tried to bring him into a conversation with himself. And when that didn't work and Jonah stormed off like a, a little toddler in a tantrum, he sat on the hillside waiting to see great fireworks of destruction upon Nineveh and he's roasting in the hot sun. So God tries another tack. This time he gives him a leaf over his head. He shades him from the sun. But when that doesn't change Jonah's attitude towards Nineveh, God chooses to destroy the thing that Jonah had found joy in, the plant that was bringing him shade. And added to that we read, and the sun grew hot and God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. We may wonder, why would God do this to his own prophet? But I would suggest it was to just demonstrate to Jonah how quickly he became attached to a plant that was very temporary. That the plant that had just grown up overnight brought him happiness. And when it was destroyed, he again felt so angry. So God asked him another question, similar to the first question. Again, God asks, is it right for you to be angry? But this time he adds on, is it right for you to be angry that the plant died? In other words, you wouldn't answer me, Jonah, about was it right for you to get angry about me forgiving the people of Nineveh? But can, can you tell me, Jonah, do you think it is right for you to get angry over this plant that I provided for you? You've never cared for the plant? but you've only enjoyed its benefits. Tell me, Jonah, is it right that you get angry when it dies? Well, God had lit the torch onto Jonah this time as he responds in great anger. Yes, even angry enough to die, shouts Jonah. And in his gentleness and love, in his grace and compassion, God quickly explains that if this is how Jonah feels about a plant, a plant that sprung up overnight, a plant that he had been under the shade of such a short period of time, how then must God feel about the 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness? We do not get to hear Jonah's response. And perhaps we feel robbed of the end of the story. We want to know if Jonah got over himself and rejoiced in the salvation of the people of Nineveh. Or did he just give up on God because God didn't act the way Jonah thought he should? But we must remember what we said at the very beginning in the first week of our series on Jonah. We said the book of Jonah is God's word to his people through a story about a prophet. It's not important that we find out what Jonah ended up doing, but it's vital that we learn the lessons God is teaching from this amazing book. This is a book about God's grace, mercy, compassion and forgiveness, not just towards a prophet, one of God's own children, but also to that prophet's enemies. What can we learn from all that we have heard in Jonah. Well, time has beaten us this week, but next week in our final look at this small book, we will look again at many of the lessons that God has been teaching us through this story. Perhaps if you have some time between now and next Sunday, you could read the, these four short chapters again. Read them quietly. Read them with a heart that says, God, what are you teaching me 
through this? What have I to learn? Who am I in this story? Am I the sailors hit by somebody else's storm? Am I Jonah and walking away from what you're asking me to do? Am I the Ninevites, people with terrible background, but who came to faith in God? What is it that God wants you to hear? What is God teaching you as an individual and us as a church family? I'm excited, excited to finish off Jonah next week and, and, and dissect all these wonderful questions that God is asking us. So spend time in God's word between now and then. Sit before him and ask what it is God is saying to you. Amen. As we reflect on God's attitude towards Jonah, towards the Ninevites and towards ourselves, we join together in that beautiful hymn grace. Let us sing our praise to God. As we draw our service to a close, we want to spend some time in prayers for others. When you hear the words, Lord, in your mercy, would you respond with the words, hear our prayer? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we come before you today to pray for the needs of others, we pray especially for our brothers and sisters in Pinetown Methodist Church. 
Lord, we think especially of those involved directly with the work and witness of Pakamisa. We pray that you would comfort the family, friends and colleagues of Tokazani, especially in this time of sudden grief. And Lord, we remember our World Development and Relief Team here in Ireland and pray that you would strengthen and guide them through this difficult journey. We thank you, Father, that they are invested in people. But we acknowledge that because of this, because of these close friendships, that they will feel the deep pain of Tokazani's death. Lord, we ask that you would raise up a natural leader to continue the work of Pakamisa. And we give you thanks for the life and legacy of Tokazani and praise you that she is rejoicing in your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we come before you on behalf of our country, especially in this time of change and uncertainty. We pray for those whose jobs are at risk, for those who are fearful to return to work because of health issues, and for business owners who are struggling in an unstable and unpredictable economic climate. Lord, we think of all those affected globally by COVID-19 and ask for strength and endurance for all those involved in their medical treatment and wisdom and guidance for world leaders as they negotiate this unprecedented pandemic. Lord, we pray for our own leaders, both in Westminster and in Stormont. Give them your wisdom, guidance, direction and grace, we pray, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, as we reflect upon the story of Jonah, we bring before you those individuals or people groups whom we struggle with. We ask that you would soften our hearts and help us to demonstrate your love, mercy and grace to all peoples. Lord, for those in our world who suffer discrimination, abuse, unfair treatment, give them your strength, your peace and your comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, we pray for the church in our land and across the world. Bless and guide our president, the Reverend Tom McKnight, and all those who lead the Methodist Church in Ireland, especially through these difficult days. We pray for wisdom, courage and steadfastness in leading the church. May they be faithful to your word and bring the gospel to all peoples. Strengthen, guide and equip all your people, ordained or lay, those in the pulpits and those who have been placed in workplaces, schools, colleges or at home. May all our words and deeds bring glory to you. Give us clear vision, Lord, and renewed courage to witness in our community in the midst of this pandemic so that your light pierces every darkness and honour and glory would be given to your name. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Keeping our theme of grace in our sung worship this morning, we conclude our service by singing the beautiful hymn, This 
as Amazing Grace. Wherever you are watching today, are listening on the telephone from, whoever you are with, let us remember that we are part of the global church of God. And so we join in the words of the grace, which I would encourage you to speak out loud. And when doing so, envisage those that you would normally worship with. Let us share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.
Amen. I would ask that if you plan to attend some of our fellowship groups, would you continue watching this morning as we show the video that will show you how we have to move through church and the requirements that will be made of us. Thank you and see you all soon. We are excited to be able to reopen the building for our fellowship groups, but I wanted to take you on a walk through the building, highlighting what is different and what you, we need you to do any time you come into the building. Before we get into the building, let's talk about the car park. If you've been past church in the last week or so, you will have noticed that the gates have been closed. One of the reasons for this is to keep the car park as empty as possible for when we need to use it. If you're arriving at church by car, please try to leave a minimum of a car's width between your car and the next. So as you exit or enter your car, you can keep your two meters distance from others. I know we love to chat, but we can no longer congregate in the car park for a chat. We need to make our way into and out of the building as quickly as possible. As you come through the main doors, Please make sure that there is at least two metres or six foot between members of your household and anyone else. This may mean that you need to queue outside for a few moments. Please sanitise your hands as you walk in. There is a sanitising unit on the wall beside the toilet door in the foyer. There will be no leaflets or flyers on the information table, but there will be some disposable masks if you feel more comfortable using one. Hymn books and church Bibles cannot be used for the time being. The first unisex toilet will be open for use. We have disconnected the hand dryers as their use is not recommended during the pandemic, but disposable hand towels are available. Please make sure you place any used ones in the bin provided. Do not flush them. If you're using the toilet, Please make sure you put the lid down before you flush, as this minimises the spread of any water droplets which could possibly contain the virus. As a disabled toilet does not have a lid, we will be keeping this toilet closed and encouraging everyone to use the first unisex toilet. But if you need the provision of that disabled toilet, please do not hesitate to ask the door steward who will arrange for it to be open for you. The kitchen will be closed, but there will be bottles of water available in church if you need a drink. Before you move from the entrance hall into the sanctuary, the door steward must record that you are there in case anyone does test positive for COVID-19 and we need to trace all who were in the building. These details will be kept on file for a few weeks and then destroyed. The door into the main sanctuary will be open so as few people as possible touch the door handle. The chairs and coffee tables will be set out two meters or six foot apart. Please do not move the tables or chairs. Please walk to the first available table and chair furthest from the door so that we don't have to pass by each other. As we are unable to use the kitchen facilities, please bring your own hot or cold drink, including your cup and a little snack, so we can enjoy a cuppa and fellowship together. For your convenience, there will be boxes of tissues provided, but I would ask that you follow the government guideline. Catch it, bin it, kill it. All waste paper bins will have bin bags in them, which will be safely disposed of after each meeting. A one-way system is in place, so we will enter through the main doors and exit via the shell room. If you require the toilet facilities during the fellowship group, please leave the main sanctuary via the shell room and re-enter the building via the front doors to access the toilets. When we have finished, I would ask that you don't hang around, but leave via the shell room, respecting the two metres, six foot, 
social distancing at all times. There is a hand sanitizer in the shell room for your use on the way out. Please check that you take everything with you as you leave. We are moving forward in tiny steps and will hopefully return fully to Sunday morning service sometime in the autumn. If you have decided not to participate in a fellowship group, but after watching the video or in time, we'd like to be part of one, please contact myself or your care coordinator from Church Council. As you can see, there has been a lot of work put into getting the building ready and I would like to thank everyone involved who has worked so diligently behind the scenes. But all of this will be in vain if we don't respect the guidelines. So to highlight, keep two metres six foot apart at all times from anyone who is in another household. This means no hugs, no handshakes or no pats on the back. We must not sing out loud or raise our voices. So please make sure that if someone else is contributing to the group, that everyone else is quiet to help those who may have hearing difficulties. Sanitize your hands on entering and leaving the building. I hope I have remembered to include everything, but if you have any questions, worries or comments, do not hesitate to contact me. I look forward to seeing you here in the building just as soon as you feel that you are ready to join us. In the meantime, keep safe and look after yourself. God bless.